Good evening. Uh, as that really loud voice, uh, the Wizard of Oz, just said, my name is uh, Todd Bull. I am a pulmonary and critical care physician at the University of Colorado, where I am uh, privileged to uh, direct our pulmonary vascular disease program, work with a, a number of very uh, excellent clinicians, nurses, APPs, uh, and also um, uh, for the last uh, few years have been privileged to uh, oversee or to chair the PHA SLC um, uh, research committee. Um, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. So we get our slide deck up here, which is not appearing in front of me, so we'll Hopefully we'll fire up here momentarily. Oh, got one going there. All right, it is not showing down here, so I'm gonna go from memory of where it is uh, here. So there's a picture of me. Uh, so pulmonary hypertension and research. And so this iconic photo, um, 1991, the four founders of the PHA sitting around the kitchen table and you know, to be a fly on that wall, to hear what they had talked about, um, I have to believe, uh, and I'm quite sure, that part of that discussion was trying to figure out how to stimulate research in pulmonary hypertension, how to bring clinicians together, basic scientists together, uh, how to do this in a way that would jump forward, uh, really ignite the, uh, the world of pulmonary vascular disease, pulmonary hypertension from a research standpoint with the ultimate goal of improving care, improving how patients live, thrive, survive, and ultimately that elusive trying to get to that, that cure. Um, and really, it, you know, it's amazing, again, look around the room, uh, what they've started, what they've brought on, and what I'm going to talk to you about today is really their efforts and the PHA's role in sort of bringing that uh, to fruition, to light. So, how much have we learned uh, in the last few years? Um, uh, in the last, uh, you know, 10 since I started my career, um, here we see uh, images I just have taken from uh, a luminary in the disease, um, uh, from the New England Journal, Paul Hassoun, has published on this just in the last year, showing uh, we see the plexiform lesion, this very abnormal proliferation of cells. And when I started my career, more than one or two years ago. Um, we were really focused on what these cell types were. I spent a lot of time at that juncture staining, trying to figure out what we were looking at. Are they endothelial cells? Are they smooth muscle cells? Um, but really, what we've uh, learned and been able to unwind from those discussions, that investigative work, uh, then led to uh, these, these therapeutic pathways, you know, disease states, um, understanding where the, we are able to improve uh, uh, vasoconstriction, uh, inhibit uh, vasoconstriction, promote vasodilatation, and it's really this back and forth of taking these sort of agents from the bedside back to the bench, from the bench to the bedside. This is really how we uh, advanced the field, advanced things going forward. And this is, you know, uh, that research continues on and is accelerating, if anything. So understanding the, gene the genes involved in pulmonary vascular disease, understanding the mechanisms of signal transduction. This is where our new therapies and new, uh, whole new lines of therapies are being developed. And all of this, of course, comes from the investigative work, the investigative work at the bench, the investigative work at the bedside. And if anything, over the last few years, we've learned uh, what can occur if we look at the pandemic in and of itself, in the discovery of COVID, um, you know, some, a, disease, a, a disease that didn't even exist a few years ago. When you put people towards this project, when you put appropriate funding to it, we come up with uh, effective vaccines rapidly. We come up with effective treatments rapidly and really change the progression of disease. And this, of course, works in all areas of medicine. The Pulmonary Hypertension Association has been involved in this really since its inception, that, again, that iconic photo, but then leading not to just ideas and bringing people together, but actual research and uh, actually putting money towards this investigative efforts. And you know, many in this room have participated in fundraisers and walks and dinners, and really it's, it's your guys' uh, uh, efforts toward this which have facilitated much of this research. And we see research funding back as early as 2000, and uh, not small dollar amounts. We're looking at you know, millions of dollars going in in early 2000, uh, those escalating into 2015. And if we look at this in a cumulative fashion, I mean, we're talking about 20, 30, 
30 millions of dollars directly from the Pulmonary Hypertension Association, really, again, trying to categorize this or uh, to uh, catalyze this, this move towards effective treatment, better treatment, effective diagnosis, ultimately, again, this goal of a cure for pulmonary hypertension. So we have a number of current awards, that is research awards. Again, these are very direct effects of this money going towards investigators. We have the Aldrighetti Research Award for Young Investigators, the PHA Pediatric uh, Research Award, the PHA Innovation Research Award, the PHA Early Career Mentored Scientist Award, and then PVD Omics, which we're gonna hear some more about from Dr. Mathai here in the near future. And so five different active awards uh, where uh, the PHA, um, uh, with the help of the SLC, is putting money towards investigators uh, discovering, trying to come up with new paradigms for treatment, new paradigms for diagnosis. Let's talk about these in some more detail. So the Aldrighetti Research Award for Young Investigators. Many in this room knew Reno Aldrighetti. We heard about him at lunch. He was really my introduction to the Pulmonary Hypertension Association uh, a number of years ago, m many years ago now. You know, Reno really had a passion uh, for bringing uh, people into this, uh, into this field. Uh, you know, the PHA was the source of my very first research award. It really launched my career, and had, I had direct discussions with Reno about applying for it and then receiving it and how excited he was when I first, uh, first received that award. And so Reno, I think many uh, know, uh, passed away here this, uh, this last month and, and then we sorely missed uh, in our midst, but really left a legacy. And so this award was named specifically for him. It was grant for junior investigators, again, a, a um, uh, a passion of his, and it's a two-year award for $40,000 per year. That award is ongoing uh, and is just awarded uh, by our SLC uh, just a couple of months ago. Uh, the PHA Pediatric Research Award, a one-year pilot award for established or new investigators. Um, this is uh, dedicated to meet unmet or to find unmet needs in pediatric research. The PHA Innovation Research Award, if you will, this is the shoot for the SARS, the swing for the senses, uh, the fences award. So um, really what we're looking for in this particular award is really highly innovative ideas, you know, things that might not get funded by other mechanisms, um, but giving uh, investigators a chance to, to really generate some, some very novel preliminary data and then uh, turn that in hopefully into another award uh, later down the road. And then this is a really important award, the PHA Early Career Mentored Scientist Award. So this is um, for uh, young investigators uh, attempting to get a award from the NIH or NHLBI um, who just miss, for example, on their case. So they have a great idea, a great uh, a lab, a great mentor, and um, there's something else the research just needs a little bit more tweaking before it's ready. And so the PHA, in collaboration with the PHA, we uh, provide funds uh, for those individuals to, to really shore that grant up a little bit. Again, really hope to drive them uh, towards a full career uh, in pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and then lastly, again, um, uh, we'll hear about this in more detail, but really since about 2015, the PHA has been funding this extremely exciting venture, that is the PBD omics um, uh, project in the deep phenotyping of patients with pulmonary hypertension uh, of all categories, really trying to, to get at, again, new ideas about diagnosis, treatment, um, uh, et cetera. And so, really, again, this is just from 2016 on. We see the investigators the PHA uh, has funded. Um, again, many of these will now go on to a career in PHA. This will be the future. The new um, discoveries uh, will come, uh, I'm quite sure, from, uh, from a number of these investigators. Um, and they were young once investigators. So these are uh, investigators that, uh, uh, you know, really now go forward. We see Paul Yu in 2006, Stephen Mathai, who will, he's still pretty young, uh, but he'll come up here in 2009, Stephen Chan, Edis Again, these are, you know, um, luminaries, if you will, um, really uh, uh, right now making seminal, seminal discussions uh, or, or uh, uh, discoveries in the field of pulmonary vascular disease. Um, and so, uh, just really a, a reiteration of how important, you know, putting this money towards uh, investigators, allowing them uh, the opportunity to grow uh, and to continue to dedicate their careers in this way and how, th what that can turn uh, to um, if, once you put it in place. And of course, 
you know, the role of patients in pulmonary hypertension. And so, you know, a very direct role here uh, at this conference today is the research room. Um, this has been uh, uh, in presence since the early days of PHA, the very first PHA conference. Um, see Greg Elliott uh, there, and those were mostly registries. Um, uh, you know, this progressed to actually drawing blood samples at Minnesota was my first um, uh, opportunity to work in the research room and, and get samples from my own research. Um, uh, I met Bob France there at the, uh, for he was at that same, uh, that same research room and, um, uh, you know, went to the University of Minnesota to process those super valuable samples. So an opportunity with people coming from all over the country with this rare disease. And, you know, really our thanks you know, to you that participate um, uh, to give us the opportunity to, you know, your time, um, uh, you know, a blood sample or a history uh, to really help us figure this out. And that, of course, then relates across, you know, going back to your communities, your participation in clinical trials. This is how we drive the science forward. This is how we figure out the next treatment uh, for pulmonary hypertension is your participation. And so our thanks uh, to you for, for doing that. So here's just a, a quick plug, our research room hours. Um, uh, if I think I'll go back, go by, see what these investigators are up to. Again, many of these are the future um, of pulmonary hypertension in terms of investigative space. And so I want to thank really quickly the steering uh, committee. So this is um, individuals on the PHA uh, who donate their time to review these grants. Um, they're a great group to work with, really you know, excellent investigators in their own right. Um, spend their time, Matt uh, Lamney, Karen Fagan uh, from University of South Alabama, Eric Austin from Vanderbilt, Steve Edman from University of Colorado, and Benicio de Jesus Perez from Stanford. Um, really a, a fantastic group to work with and are reviewing. Uh, we are getting ready to review some of these grants just posted now is the Pediatric Award and the uh, Swing for the Fences Award, the Highly Innovation Award. So we're looking forward to receiving grants along those lines and excited to see where those um, scientific projects will take us. Um, and so really, let's just let close with this. You know, um, have no doubt, you know, what, uh, what highly motivated people can accomplish when they put their minds to it, this iconic, you know, uh, chair again, the, the kitchen table, uh, leading us to this meeting, leading us to, you know, uh, um, uh, really combine our efforts on the investigative side. This is how we uh, move this field forward. This is how we catalyze um, our move towards a cure. So thank you uh, for your attention. So now it is my great honor uh, to, uh, to introduce a good friend of mine, um, Dr. Steve Matai, the once young, still pretty young, um, uh, uh, investigator from, uh, from uh, John Hopkins. So Dr. Matai is an associate professor of medicine. Uh, again, he uh, trained uh, at Johns Hopkins and uh, then has gone on to co-direct their pulmonary vascular disease program. Uh, he is an expert in the uh, diagnosis and treatment of patients with pulmonary hypertension. His you know, research interests uh, move towards early diagnosis and has published some really uh, fascinating work in this area with ongoing research projects along those now. Uh, and as part of his quite impressive, there's actually like a three paragraph long thing I'm supposed to read about him here, but uh, uh, I'm just going to summarize here at this juncture. Highly impressive uh, uh, CV. Uh, he is also a PI on the PBD omics program, which he's going to talk to us about now. Very exciting research opportunity. And just as a small aside, a uh, friend of mine uh, was able to train Dr. Matai in the cath lab, and I happen to know uh, he also is a student of popular culture, an expert on, on TV shows and movies from the 1990s. And so I would uh, pump him for questions on things like The Simpsons when he's around and see if he can name your favorite character, your favorite episode, things along those lines. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Steve Matai. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Todd, for that introduction. I will not be accepting questions about The Simpsons at this venue. Um, but uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about PBDomics today because I, I know it's a, it's a pretty exciting thing in, in our field and uh, I'm hopeful that I can express some of the uh, exciting things to you. Um, so for the next two hours, I'll be talking about, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I will keep it short. Um, so these are the questions I'm going to try to answer today about PBDomics. Uh, so we'll go through each of them, and hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll have a better understanding of what it is, what we've learned thus far, and what we hope to learn going forward. 
So this is the, the logo for PBDomics, and as you can see, there's a heart and a lung. So the study is focused on the heart and the lungs and the interaction between the two with a focus on pulmonary vascular disease or pulmonary hypertension. What does it stand for? <clears throat> well, PBDomics is an acronym for pulmonary vascular disease omics. Well, that doesn't really help you if you don't know what omics are, and I had to look up omics on Webster's, and this is what Webster's said, a, a field of biologic si sciences that ends with omics. <laughs> I always hate when you look up a word and the definition has the word in it. It doesn't help me understand what it is. But they did have an addendum saying, well, it's genomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics. Those are uh, studies of genes and proteins and the gene products and small molecules that interact together in our biological systems that we think of as our body, okay? So this is a study of how these particular molecules may interact in our body. And the purpose of the study is to redefine pulmonary hypertension through pulmonary vascular disease phenomics. Now, phenomics is just a term that puts all those omics together, okay? So these are all omics terms, but hopefully a little bit better understanding. So why might we need PBDomics? Well, I think it's highlighted, there are many reasons and many things we hope to learn, but one of the things I think is most relevant from a clinical perspective is to classify and understand how the patient in front of us in clinic or the patient as, as you um, might actually, um, what, what, how the disease affects him or her personally. So let me give you an example of how we might uh, use PBDomics or what we might learn from PBDomics. So if we have a 64-year-old woman with scleroderma who presents with shortness of breath and her preliminary evaluation suggests pulmonary hypertension, she undergoes a thorough evaluation, including a right heart catheterization that does show pulmonary hypertension, but as part of that evaluation, we notice that her left-sided heart pressures are a little bit high. She has a little bit of interstitial lung disease on her CAT scan. She has some sleep, uh, a, a sleep apnea on her sleep study, and her blood work suggests some mild kidney disease. Well, that's a very common scenario in our patient population when we see patients in clinic, but it makes it difficult to classify our patients. This is our classification system for pulmonary hypertension, and if you don't know about this, I'm sure over the course of this conference, you will hear much about the clinical classification of pulmonary hypertension. Fall into five groups. You have group one, which is PAH, group two, pulmonary hypertension related to left heart disease, Group three, pulmonary hypertension in the setting of lung disease, so that could be COPD, interstitial lung disease, sleep apnea. Group four is chronic thromboembolic disease, or pulmonary embolus. And group five is a hodgepodge of other diseases that can cause pulmonary hypertension through multiple different mechanisms. So what about the patient that I was talking about? Well, scleroderma predisposes you to group one, two, and three disease. I told you that the patient has some degree of interstitial lung disease, which would put her in group three. She also has sleep apnea, which might put her in group three. And what is the role of her kidney disease? Is that contributing to pulmonary hypertension? So the question I would ask of anybody is, well, what pH group is she in? So what we're trying to figure out with, with our study is how to better classify these patients. Because currently, our therapies are directed for patients in group one, some patients in group three, and some patients in group four. What about everybody else? So who is PVDomics? And I'm alternating between PVDomics and PVDomics, because I'm not sure exactly if we came to a consensus on how we're gonna say it, but I, if I alternate, it's not because I don't know, well, I guess it is, it's because I don't know. But <laughs> in any case, um, PVDomics is you. It is the patient with this disease their caregivers, their families, their friends who have volunteered to participate in this study. PBDomics was uh, housed at multiple different centers. I have a, a map here of where we uh, have centers in the country, uh, Brigham and Women's up in Boston, Columbia and Cornell in New York, our institution in Baltimore, Vanderbilt, Mayo Clinic, University of Arizona, and then the Data Coordinating Center at Cleveland Clinic. The NIH sponsored this, uh, this activity along with, as we heard about, the Pulmonary Hypertension Association. And this support was invaluable to complete this study, and uh, I will tell you uh, what it involved. So here is a page, uh, the, the first page of the first paper that uh, Anna Hemnes uh, uh, led, uh, describing the study. 
So from this paper, I'm gonna quote a little bit about the approach and what the goals were. So it was to perform comprehensive phenotyping and endophenotyping across the World Health Organization classified pH clinical groups, those groups one through five, as well as intermediate phenotypes, including those patients without overt pulmonary hypertension, in order to deconstruct the traditional classification and define new meaningful subclassifications of patients with pulmonary vascular disease. And this fancy figure that was developed here really is trying to, to highlight how we're taking information we gather from the patient at the bedside, patient, uh, information we get from the catheterization lab, information we get from imaging studies, and information we get from blood that is collected on these patients, and trying to integrate that all to understand different types of pulmonary hypertension. So how does this work um, practically? So if you are a patient with pulmonary hypertension and you came to a center that was enrolling patients for, for PBDomics, um, you might be enrolled in PBDomics if you agreed to participate. It didn't really matter when you were diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension. You could have pulmonary hypertension for five years, for a couple months, or be newly diagnosed at the time of your enrollment. You were followed clinically, and after a period of time, we would do a repeat evaluation on some of the patients who were enrolled in the study. So what does this look like from a visit standpoint? Well, it's pretty labor intensive. So patients who volunteered to be in the study, first of all, obviously provided consent to participate. They, we took a medical history, we assigned them a, a functional class, we took vital signs, blood tests, and multiple blood tests. Um, we did a physical exam, we did it, uh, a weight to, waist to hip ratio, body composition, bioimpedance measurements, which sounds painful, but it's really just standing on a special scale. Um, we did some quality of life questionnaires, EKG, echocardiogram, we did pulmonary function tests, a six minute walk test, and then we gave you a sleep study uh, equipment to take home. You did a sleep study and you sent it back to us. That's one visit. The second visit, you came back in, we did vital signs, got an exam. You had a cardiac catheterization with blood draw during the catheterization for some of those omics that I was mentioning before from the pulmonary artery, from the pulmonary capillary wedge, uh, and from arterial if it was available. So different places in the body with the catheter in place, we would draw blood from that. And then if you were at one of four centers that were doing this, we would exercise you while you had the catheter in your body. And we would take additional blood measurements during the catheterization. If you were at a center that, weren't, that wasn't doing the interventional uh, exercise test, we would ask you to do a separate exercise test where you rode a bicycle and we did similar measurements. Then you had a cardiac MRI. And you came back. And you came back and we did additional blood draws if we hadn't completed all the blood draws that we had uh, pre-specified. -pre you got a high resolution CT of the chest and a VQ scan. So very labor intensive from a patient perspective. So we're, we're very happy to report that our first paper describing the clinical characteristics of this cohort, of this study, has been accepted at the uh, Journal of American College of Cardiology and should be available online soon, where we describe some of the clinical characteristics and survival of patients who participated in our study. So uh, here's our, our figure one, just to describe the patients who participated. Um, as you can see, we, have, we included over 1,100, close to 1,200 patients to participate in this study. We had 96 healthy controls and 347 comparators. And I think this is the key feature of this study that differentiates it from any other cohort study that's been conducted in pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary vascular disease to date. We enrolled patients who were at risk of pulmonary hypertension but did not have pulmonary hypertension by right heart catheterization. So that allows us to do unique comparisons across the spectrum of clinical testing to imaging, again, to these omic analyses to understand are there signals that might, we might be able to detect that would tell us that pulmonary hypertension is developing. I'm gonna spend the next couple of minutes just talking about the right-hand side of this uh, figure where we talk about the different types of pulmonary hypertension that we enrolled. As you can see, most of the patients had group one disease, so they're in the PAH group, but we had a large number of patients with group two, left heart disease, a lot of patients with group three, related to respiratory disease, et cetera. 
So focusing in on that, because I think this relates to the question that I posed earlier about that woman who came in with scleroderma who had a little bit of elevation of left-sided heart filling pressures, some interstitial lung disease, sleep apnea. When we looked at our group and we had a separate adjudication committee assess the classification of the patients based upon our review of all the data that was available, we ended up finding that people didn't fit perfectly in one group. So if you look at this table here, in the top left where it says group one, if you go across to the right, you'll see that group two, out of that group one patient, 28 of our group one patients had group two features. 62 of, the, of that group had group three features. And you can see going across of group one, 93 or more than a quarter of the patients that we classified as PAH actually had features of other uh, forms of pulmonary hypertension. And in fact, when we put this all together, almost 40% of patients in our cohort had multiple different groups of pulmonary hypertension represented, uh, and only about 60%, or I should say a majority, but 60% really only fell into one group. So we have a lot of mixed picture here with our patients. I'm not going to go into detail with all the rest of the findings because there, there are uh, a lot of them, but I think I'm going to highlight a couple of the interesting things as well. So uh, for our PAH patients, 50% of patients had an abnormal CAT scan of the chest. We think of pulmonary hypertension, PAH, as being a disease where you do not have any evidence of abnormalities on your CAT scan, but when we did detailed analyses of the CAT scan, in fact, there were abnormalities. So do patients have underlying lung disease? Is it because of the pulmonary hypertension? Is it occurring with the pulmonary hypertension? And what's the impact of that on how we manage patients? We found that while we expected there to be significant differences in literally across the panel of, of analyses that we did for our patients for testing, we found that group one, two, and three patients all had a low diffusing capacity. Not that we really expected to see that in group two as much as we did in group three, but then also our group one patients demonstrated that as well. And then echocardiographic markers that we look at for our patients with CTEF, the right atrium seemed to be much larger than in other disease states. Again, a, a, something that has not been described well because of the design of this court being able to look at pulmonary hypertension across the spectrum of disease. So what, what will we learn from pulmonary, uh, uh, from pulmonary hypertension studies in PVDomics? Well, questions we're trying to answer are, is pulmonary hypertension more similar than dissimilar across the clinical classification groups? Is there a signature in the blood or a collection of clinical tests that might predict the development of pulmonary hypertension in patients at risk? Is there a response to, uh, to specific therapies for pulmonary hypertension? Are there signals that we can identify in these omic signatures that might uh, determine which patient would, would respond to, which, uh, to a particular agent? And are there implications for survival based upon these characterizations of patients? And importantly, we really are very interested to know if these omics analyses will reveal new therapeutic targets for all types of pulmonary hypertension. So in conclusion, PVDomics is a multicenter study of pulmonary hypertension that aims to redefine the current clinical classification schema. PVDomics is uniquely positioned to understand novel phenotypes of pulmonary hypertension based upon what I told you regarding the types of patients that were enrolled. And these findings may, better, may help better identify patients at high risk of pulmonary hypertension, select best therapies for individual patients, and predict survival. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all of our uh, collaborators and co-investigators for the study who are listed here. Particularly, uh, I would like to thank the PHA for their support for, of this initiative. And importantly, all of the patients, caregivers, and volunteers who participated in this study. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mathai. It was really, I think, a, a great um, introduction to PVDomics for all of us, and we look forward to all the great outputs that are going to come from that project over the next decade. Um, so many of our patients, healthcare providers, and other community members have used art as a way to cultivate their creativity, share their experiences, and find hope. After debuting at the 2018 conference, PHA is once again hosting an 
art gallery where these community members can share their hope with all of you. To help support PHA's mission, everyone will be able to purchase tickets to win artwork created by these members of the PH community. Please everyone, take some time tomorrow to visit and be inspired by the beautiful artwork and purchase your tickets for just $5. Throughout the PHA's conference, we're all learning about and discussing personalized medicine. Tomorrow, you'll have the opportunity to personalize your own conference experience with global leaders in pulmonary hypertension during the networking with the medical professional breakfast. This is a really unique opportunity for patients to sit with healthcare leaders in PH and specifically ask about a variety of topics before attending the day's PHA conference breakout sessions. So please take advantage and join us back here from eight to nine tomorrow morning. Thank you and have a wonderful evening.